afternoon and welcome to Social Suites ESG webinar. My name is Jessica Schlosser and I manage Social Suites business development. ESG is quite simply an additional layer of transparency with stakeholders about your organisation. Social Suite helps small to medium organisations in providing this additional transparency through ESG reporting with intuitive software that will populate your own ESG disclosure report with ease and expert sustainability consulting services to guide your progress. It has never been easier to share your progress and get recognition for the great work you're doing already by aligning to a global ESG standard. Today, I'm joined by our Head of ESG, Dr. Tim Seigenbeek van Hookelom, and Glenn Fozard, Managing Director of Environmental Clean Technologies, who will share their personal experiences of ECT's ESG journey thus far. Throughout the presentation, please don't hesitate to ask questions in the chat box on the right, and we'll respond at the end. Now I'll hand over to Tim. Thank you. Excellent. Thanks, Jess, for the introduction. And uh, welcome, Glenn. It's great to have you here with us today. Before we jump into our conversation, um, I'd like to uh, welcome everyone and just run you through quickly what we are going to do today. We'll spend the next 20, 25 minutes. Um, first, we'll, uh, we'll look at an introduction from Glenn around um, environmental clean technologies. What is the business doing? Uh, learn a bit more about, uh, about the, their business. After that, we'll jump into that ESG journey and we'll have a conversation around ESG urgency, pressure on companies in the market, why ESG reporting is a variety of reasons we see why companies start that journey around ESG. How do you then kick that off? How do you start an ESG reporting journey? What is, what is a way to make that simple? How do you kind of really look at a quick start with ESG? But then most importantly, we'll look at some of the, the, um, the reports, the journey, the plan and the goals um, that ECT had around ESG and uh, that pathway they're on. And at the end, we'll have, a, have some time, like Jess said, for some questions and answers. So first things first, uh, Glenn, welcome. Um, thanks for, uh, for joining us today uh, in this webinar. We'd love to know, know a bit more about environmental clean technologies. It already sounds quite, from, you know, from a sustainability point of view, like a really interesting proposition there, especially if you look at technologies that enable the stable transition to zero. Can you tell us a bit more? Yeah, thanks, Tim. Um, and Thanks for everybody for listening. Um, yeah, so ECT, we've we've been uh, operating for sort of around over 10 years now, focusing in on taking low rank and waste resources and converting those into higher value products and using low emission technologies in doing so. So we've been doing that a long time. Um, we're an, essentially an engineering firm that's been focusing on that, um, you know, chemical and mechanical engineering solutions. Um, you know, so we're, we're a big key part of what we're, we've been focusing on is is how do we take advantage of waste products like um, lignite, for example, which is often called brown coal, but also waste biomass feedstocks and combine those in a fashion that then allows us to pull apart the really valuable chemistry that sits inside that um, without releasing the CO2 emissions. Um, you know, we're all familiar with how brown coal is being used currently, which is to just dig it up and burn it for electricity and, and sort of using that is probably the worst way you could actually, um, you know, refine or use a resource like that, because obviously in, in this environment, it, it's quite heavily uh, heavy emitter. Um, we, we've got a number of projects that are going on at the moment, and we're at a really interesting phase of commercialization where we're currently demonstrating um, one of our key technologies, and, and that's down at our um, uh, down at our site in Bacchus Marsh, and and from that we're we're going to learn a lot about how to build an even bigger plant, which is um, intended to be down at your lawn, right next to door to the Yulon power station, which is scheduled for shut down in 2028. And at the heart of that is we're we're looking to take this resource and then producing things like clean hydrogen. Um, critical minerals like graphitic carbon and and agricultural char for soil health. And we do that with net zero emissions and uh, zero waste discharge. So it's a pretty exciting approach. It's, it's, it's quite a, a, a technology that's suitable for now. Um, we are a transition. We, we, our focus is on the transition technology. So we don't see ourselves as being, you know, we're not green, we're not renewable, but we, uh, we do see ourselves as that bridge between today's use of resources and tomorrow's pure, um, you know, pure renewable future. So we see ourselves as a really important part of that 30 year transition towards a pure renewable future. 
Oh, thanks for sharing. That's a really good introduction there to see you know, where you as, as a business sit. And um, what it really um, draws out and what I find really interesting there is that you've given us a really good description there of basically your business model, products you're working on uh, there and what you're doing uh, around those technologies that, you, that you're developing there. So that's the business model there. But then the other side of the equation there, and that's the part of what most of you are talking about today is, of course, your business model is looking at what can we do around sustainability, responsibility, around that transition, 30 year time frame there. But then there's the other part of the equation, and that is that about corporate reporting. Now we all know, you know, everyone's doing their financial reporting, but today we're now looking at um, that next level of reporting there. Investors, stakeholders at large are asking us to show us more than basically, they want to see those non-financial disclosures. So what they're really asking for is they want to see how you're operating your business and how you're governing your business. So on that business model there, how are you doing those things there from a environmental and social governance perspective there, really getting more clarity on, there, on that. So basically, regardless of what business model you have in play there, they want you to show more greater greater transparency around how you do things effectively. And that's really what we'll be talking about today, how you know that ESG journey there, um, how ECT is you know, started doing that work there. So the next thing I want to just really bring up there is that we all know ESG is, is, is really you know, out there. Everyone hears a lot about it in the media all the time. Uh, one of the main things I saw in a, a, recently is someone saying a public business cannot survive without ESG credentials. So we see a lot of things there around that, around you know, the big accounting firms investing, regulation coming in, Japan, the SEC just earlier this week, and the US proposing climate-related disclosures, regulation compliance, Australian companies under extreme pressure over ESG. Um, on that one there, Glenn, what's your feeling from your perspective, running a business there? What do you, what are these things are in your day-to-day -day operations and business and governance? Do you see play out? What is the reality that you face? Yeah, it's, it's, um, it, it's moving fast and you can see that it's gone from, um, I guess, a good to have to something that now is becoming essential because it's 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 emerging as a real clear indicator of the trust that one company, particularly large companies, as they deal with smaller companies, can have um, in the risks of that particular company. And, and those risks are defined by you know what we've all collectively agreed on, which is the environment, um, social, and governance. And they, they, they it's a it's a good sort of tripartite of of risks that really are you know, front of mind to, to everybody these days. And, and so, you know, we see it as, and, and it comes out now more and more in the conversations that we have when we're trying to partner with larger companies. And some of these larger companies are obviously leading the charge on adoption of ESG and they're, they're you know, they're increasingly being mandated, you know, top ASX 100 companies have, you know, increasing mandates towards ESG reporting. And as a result, that's pushing back down onto the smaller companies. And, and so whilst it might feel like smaller companies can sort of avoid this for a little bit, um, I think very quickly, smaller companies run the risk of not being considered transparent or consistent with ESG enough for bigger companies to do deals with them. And that's, that's you know, that's where we're seeing the real impact on our day to day is, is in us taking a, a leading approach to adoption of ESG it it eliminates that one area of concern that a large company may have in talking to and doing a deal with a company like ours so then it clears the air of of that issue and those risks and so it allows them a more you know clearer discussion on the deal at hand yeah um now that's a really good point and i think it it, it really comes out in this in this framework as well this is a a, a really useful view at on the left there, financial disclosures, but if you look at those ESG, non-financial disclosures, uh, the United Nations Sustainable Stock Exchange Initiative looked at what are the main reasons why companies start ESG reporting and how can they unlock value in those areas there. And out of what you're saying there, we clearly see something around that risk management there, around if, if, if we are working, if we're suppliers to larger companies there, we need to make sure that you know we still be able to do that. So it's a little bit in, in that, that risk management area, we see a lot of compliance coming in there at the top level, um, uh, 
across jurisdictions in Australia. Now we're a bit behind what Europe is doing, but there's still things happening, mostly like you said, at that top ASX 100 level, but that is trickling down there. From your perspective and what you see in particular to ECT, out of these areas here, we look at you know, accessing capital from impact funders, from ESG investors, um, helping with that, that profitability and growth of the business uh, around reputation and branding. We often see that come up as well, a link to that flow of information to the stakeholders and, and really that, that investor relation and management as well there. Um, is there any particular area here that also stands out Do you think about that? Like, well, that was one of the reasons we started that process of ESG reporting as well. Yeah, it, it's it, as you get into it, you actually start to see the sense of how it helps to manage your, your, your enterprise risk, um, you know, planning and management. And, and from that, um, it starts to bring into to focus the, the effect that it has then on improving your access to capital, um, because you're able to explain, you know, notwithstanding the fact that if you if you meet the requirements and you can tick the box on ESG, I mean that's great. But the, in doing so, you tend to learn a lot more about the, the the more modern risks associated to running your business, and so then you know that flows into having more developed discussions where you can show that you're across all of these risks associated to running your business now and into the future. Um, that helps with accessing capital, helps with reputation and branding. And I think more and more it will just be adopted as just and the information flow coming then back down to investors is is considered. Um, you know, I think it's going to go quickly become from a from a differentiator to a must have. And it's, you know, at the moment, it's still a bit of a differentiator, um, you know, but I think very quickly it will become ubiquitous with, you know, just running your risk management of your business um, for modern risks and, and without it, you will not be able to access capital to the extent that others or, or to the extent that you would like um, and you will not be able to do deals with bigger companies. A very good point there and we see that really play out that a lot of companies now starting to look at that ESG non-financial disclosures not as a end of year sprint like we need to do an ESG report but that they're really looking at ESG as we need to embed this as a ongoing um, reporting mechanism throughout our operations and governance. ESC needs to become part of what we do. All these things take on those non-traditional risks. We need to work these things out and do this like we do our financial reporting. Um, it's just part of where we're going. It's going to be ubiquitous. Everyone is going to do it. So it's um, that's a very good point. But then, so I think from that is a great bridge there. It's not a question of, you know, should we be doing it? It's more like, how should we get started? Because that's where in particular in that small to mid-sized segment, you know, not you're not an ASX 100 company, you're a small, smaller company there, and you do feel that urgency that we spoke about and saw on that slide there. So a lot of headlines out there, a lot of pressure on you, but it feels too complex. There's a lot of frameworks out there. It feels quite expensive. You don't want to get one of the big four firms to do it for you. It's very time consuming, you think. It might be too difficult as well. So from that perspective there, did you experience when you started thinking around ESG reporting, building credentials, were there any of those hurdles that you ran into and how did you overcome them? Uh, absolutely. I mean, this, that's that, you know, the, I think you've put too complex in there as the biggest bubble and, and that was probably sitting front of mind for me was, you know, we, we saw ourselves as being um, naturally ESG in how we ran our business. Right, and that's uh, and, and and that's true, right? That, that, that's what we were comfortable with, and we thought that was enough, right? <laughs> you know, and and then when you look at the the complexity of you know, because unless there's a, a tight framework to help you understand that complexity, it does look overwhelming. And and I guess it it really came down to having everything sequenced out um, that fits in nicely, um, you know. And, and again, yeah. <laughs> I'll say it's, you know, without social suite, it was really difficult to, and and it, it and I often use social suites um, online resource as the as the anchor to my confusion. It's it's if if I'm starting to if I'm starting to go through all the different legislation and you know particularly around TCFD for example, it's like it all gets a bit overwhelming. So you go back to the social suite online resource and you you start to just measure against the you know the the areas that are. are more outlined and they're they're more succinct than than what appears to be complexity. So the key really is to 
just accept the fact that you know this is going to happen and if you're not going to be part of it then you will be limiting your ability um, to raise capital and do deals with bigger companies um, but then look to some somebody or something like social suite that can actually then help you define it um, we also made the other decision to bring on a dedicated resource because you know at least for the onboarding side of things i think that's really important to not be overwhelmed and and be you know, you, you do have to give some time to to the onboarding, particularly to see how you adopt these types of principles inside your day to day business without distract, distracting and detracting from your day to day business. So, you know, a couple of you know things that I would suggest to anybody is, is take advantage now because it's still a differentiator. Now is the time to differentiate, get on board. Um, utilize something like a social suite that helps to define it really clearly and 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 clear out the complexity and if possible um, you know bring in a, a dedicated resource just to help with the onboarding great points uh, there Glenn and um, yeah I agree like that's why that bubble is big most people struggle most with the complexity and it's that there's a lot of frameworks out there we don't know where to start how do we do that so that's what got us to think about that, particularly for small and medium sized businesses. If we can take that anxiety away around the complexity of it and really give you basically make that choice for you, I guess, in a way is give you the one framework that is the most consolidated um, framework, harmonizing all those frameworks out there. And you probably, you know, in that ESG space, do a bit of research. You've heard of all these things from GRI, you already mentioned TCFD, SESB, CDP. There's all these frameworks out there that over the years have been trying to capture some of that ESG reporting, but there's a whole range of them now. And there's been that consolidated effort by, you know, driven by the World Economic Forum, really by 120 CEOs from large companies around the world that said, we are doing this, but we believe every company should be doing that. We recognize that problem there of a complexity around starting that journey. If only we had that one framework that was industry agnostic with some core principles, so that's when they made this framework, which they call the stakeholder capitalism metrics. That's what we're working with you on, on that journey. And um, it really gives you a very clear starting point. What are the things we need to start thinking about, disclosing, improving upon from a governance perspective around planet? And then we're looking at that climate related disclosures, people mostly around diversity, inclusion, training, um, but also prosperity there. What are we doing around? What is our economic contribution at large, not just to our shareholder, but at large to all stakeholders? So this is the core of that taking away that complexity. And then what we've done is, like you said, we've really gone on that journey with you. Um, and it's, it is sometimes important to have someone, whether it's a dedicated resource or someone in the business that is designated an ESG lead, someone that's really taking a bit of time there to think this through and work through that first step from from a kickoff to that baseline working with us on a gap analysis and then getting to that getting in that rhythm where you have your first report there and start updating that making small improvements along the way along that esg journey and do quarterly reporting because that's really important that esg like i said should not be an end of year thing it should be something you do consistently and if you spend a little bit of time every month with an end of quarter report there you work towards a core report that can go with your annual report there, and then you keep doing that. We help you build that capacity there. And I think, you know, ECT is a great example there of going through that journey and really genuinely taking the time and effort of doing that. So with that said, the, you mentioned the um, uh, the online resource. But we, you know, this is that dashboard that we've been working on together. But I think mm -hmm. the thing is that what comes out of that, this is how you manage that, this is how we work together on that. But then what comes out of that, and that's the key thing there, is your actual tangible disclosure report there. And that's the key thing there that I really just want to, you know, stop there and, and pause. Um, you have your second report now for quarter three, um, you know, coming out. This is really that tangible um, evidence or proof to your stakeholders that it's not that, that you know, commitment you've made and then no one can really see what actually is going on. And um, this is just basically capturing for those 21 metrics we looked at what you've done, where you are. It's not about perfection, it's about where you are today. So that process there and getting that first report out, how did you feel around that, you know, coming, coming, getting to that baseline, starting that quarterly reporting now, that journey there, like what are your reflections on that? Yeah, it was, um, uh, 
there was a lot of anticipation around how this would look and and how this would um, be taken by the market. Um, it, it's really interesting. I mean, we say increasingly as we worked through and towards the the, the highlights report, uh, the quarterly highlights report, um, we, we we sort of started to get a sense of how important it is, and and so you know increasingly we built this momentum of pride in what we were doing and. And as you start to look into it and work through it, you, you can see the sense in how it all connects together. You know, I mean, on, on the face of it, if you step back and for the first time you might look at it, you just might think it's a, it's a box ticking exercise, but it's, it really isn't. Once you get into it, you can actually see how it connects to real outcomes and real impact. And, and so, you know, we very quickly then decided, well, we, let's aim to be best of peer. Let's aim to be, um, you know, define this, you know, as, as something we can lead with, even, you know, just at our size of company. Um, and so, you know, we, we, we put a lot of effort and, and time into it and, and there's a lot of pride in, in us maintaining this and improving on it. And, and once done, it's, it's easier and easier to, to, to report on because it just becomes a, a part of your day-to-day. -day. You know, it's, it's built into our audit and risk committee. Um, you know, it's built into our existing enterprise risk matrix now. Um, you know, so everything starts to, and, and then starts to feed out. Culturally, it feeds out to all the staff. You know, staff start coming up with ideas for, you know, well, instead of buying bottled, bottled water at, at, at the site, let's install a water filter so we can use the water straight out of the tap. And, you know, just even small things like that, but it all starts to filter through and it's a really important part of, of that spread and adoption of ESG principles across the entire culture. I really like that point there where when we talk about, you know, ESG and generating these reports and sharing them with your stakeholders, a lot of people automatically think of oh, stakeholders. So you're sharing your report with your shareholders effectively, maybe with some investors, but do also look at that your stakeholders, your employees are equally a very important stakeholder group and they often really want to be part of that journey there. So. I think it's really important that you bring that point up there that ESG is it's important externally, but it can equally be important internally because we see a big change there around attracting and retaining talent that say, well, we want to make sure that we work for a business that, you know, first I look at the business model, but equally I look at that. How do you actually govern your operations there? What are you doing around the environment, around you know, diversity and inclusion in the business? How do you govern yourself? From an ESG point of view, so feeding this information back to them, key thing as well. And we see that to uh, we see that play out in a lot of ways. So it's really really worthwhile sharing that. Finally, then building ESG credentials. Um, seeing this, this is also coming up in in like you said, the pride there. You've done the hard work there. You're building those those you know embedded the systems in, into the business, doing the work there, and then it's really worthwhile to actually you know show those ESG credentials you're building as a business there. So. A core element there is also the TCFD, which is the Task Force on Climate Related Financial Disclosures. It's a, um, in itself, it's a separate standard. It's been adopted in this framework as one of the 21 metrics. It takes a bit of work. Um, it's a pretty specialist piece in and of itself. You've gone through that exercise. Uh, do you have any, any reflections on that TCFD exercise and reporting on that and, and where that sits now? Yeah, it's, it's, for us, um, we're, again, we have to be commercial in how we approach these things. And you look at it and you go, okay, ideally, let's let's adopt it. Let's be the leaders and, and adopt it. Let's let's take it up to the ASX 100 level because we're talking to companies at that level. And and um, and 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 the re reality is, you know, in in talking to some of these large, you know, multi-billion-dollar companies, they're talking scope one, scope two, scope three emissions, and they're asking us, well, what solutions do we have for that? Because they can see that there's a risk on the horizon for them in dealing with us. So, you know, their scope three is our scope one and two emissions, and so you know, you, you're starting to see this this talk involved in the day-to-day, -day, you know, deal negotiations, and so it's. It's important to really understand it and understand its effect. And for us, we're now at that stage where, okay, how far do we progress it? You know, we've, we've, we, we're certainly going to be looking at bringing our business back to, you know, under G8 greenhouse gas um, emissions, bringing that back to net zero and, and keep on measuring it against the, the baseline year. But 
TCFD is is a is an area that we're keen to sort of push into and and be ready for when it becomes mandatory. You know, there's a, there's a bit of time I think to go under and water to go under the bridge on that, but um, you know, scope one and scope two emissions, I think everyone should be getting wrapping their heads around that really quickly. Um, scope three, it will come um, because it's the scope three emissions that will force change across everybody, and I think eventually. Um, once it reaches, you know, critical mass on scope one and scope two, then it will become mandatory to understand scope three and, and account for it. And then that's the, you know, close the book, so to speak, on everybody's accountability for emissions because everyone will be pulled into line. You know, it's, it's companies forcing compliance upon other companies that they're doing business with to account for downstream emissions. And I think it's good. Um, it, it does, as you say, it's a, it's a specialised area, so it's... it's um, it can be overwhelming and there's a lot of information out there, but I think if you just take it step by step and, 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 you know, work with somebody like social suite, you'll, you'll start to get a feel for it. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a really important emerging area, I think, and whether it ends up being TCFD adopted across the, you know, across the world or, or whether it's some other similar framework, I think it's coming. This whole concept of, of scope one, scope two and scope three emissions, I think is is being adopted broadly and I think it's probably here to stay. Um, and and what, a really clever way of making sure that everyone um, is accountable to their emissions and not just their own emissions that they produce, but the emissions of the people they do, um, you know, suppliers and, and off takers and downstream um, users of products and things like that. So yeah, I think it's a, it's a really important area, but one that's emerging and one that I think um, you, you recommend that you, you take some advice from the likes of Social Suite um, in understanding how the complexity of that area. Well, thanks for sharing that. And I think the, the key takeaway there, which I find really interesting, is to your point that this is not regulation yet for most companies in Australia, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't be doing this. And the key, key point there is that the larger companies are basically forcing you to do that. If you want to work with a larger company, they'll ask you for your carbon footprint. They'll ask you for you. They want to see what you're doing there. So it's really a market driven uh, kind of compliance rather than a you know, government regulation coming. So it is very timely to really start working on what is your carbon footprint, understanding that and starting that TCFD work there. So with that, and we're getting close to time. I just wanted to just go back to Jess and see if in the chat any questions have come up, anything that um, people might want to ask Glenn. Yes, fantastic. Thank you. I have one question. Um, does using brown coal as a feedstock represent any reputational risk? And how does ESG reporting help or hinder with that? Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's, a, it's a topical question and it's an important question because um, you know, one of those feedstocks that we look at um, to use is brown coal and, and brown coal's had a terrible reputation for all the right reasons. It's had the bad reputation. It's It's been used to generate electricity, but in doing so, you generate a lot of uh, emissions. Well, we, we take the view that, you know, there's a lot of really valuable chemistry in there that can support, you know, the ongoing development of the renewable industry that sits inside there. If it can be done on the basis of, net zero emission and zero waste discharge, then you end up with a really good, um, you know, use for that particular that particular resource and an ongoing future use for it. So where ESG work helps us is that um, it allows us to set that framework of reporting and transparency about who we are. So, you know, we like to not let the idea of brown coal get in the way of the science. And so we're trying to push the science now. This is all for us. ESG is all about building trust. You know, if we're if we're um, tr open and transparent with our reporting on emissions and and governance and people and prosperity, then there's more chance that we're going to be able to have the conversation about the science that sits behind it that underpins our our view that brown coal can be used in a valuable way with net zero emission. And so ESG and, and reporting regularly and and against the ESG. Um, framework is is what helps us build that trust to have that conversation about the science. Amazing, thank you. Yes, and another question. Um, 
data centers, i.e. cloud technology, um, what are the associated emissions of those and how they're used by tech companies? It's a great question there, and we see that come up increasingly. Um, initially, you know, a lot of people think carbon emission and fossil fuels, but then there's a really important element there, indeed, about cloud technology, big data, data, no server farms there. So what we see in, in effectively in looking at calculating your carbon footprint, it's really important to understand the number of employees you have in your business, what software, what technologies you use, and then based on those things, it's really getting an, an overview of the business, how you operate, what you do, what you use to be able to calculate those emissions and cloud technologies and data farms are a really important part of that. So by knowing what software you use, there's standardized formulas that you can work out what are the associated commissions, uh, emissions from those type of cloud computing software services you might be using. And of course, if you run your own, that, that changes the equation as well. It's really then working out what's the size and scope of what you, you have you know, basically on your premises or what you've rented there. So again, like TCFD, cal calculating carbon footprint is a bit of a specialized area. It's really important to use a recognized and scientific technology there. So what we really do is work out with what's the size of the, your business? Where are you trying? What are you trying to do in calculating your carbon footprint? Are you interested about scope one and two? Do you want to go in, including scope three as well? And that's then really working towards where do you want to end up with just a carbon footprint understanding? Do you want to also look at ways of avoiding, reducing and offsetting some of those emissions there? Do you want some type of certification around that? Where do you want to end up? So what are your goals and targets and objectives around carbon neutrality, net zero? Um, how do you want to align with the Paris Agreement scenarios? So a lot of those questions there, but indeed, um, yeah, totally uh, should not be overlooked data farm emissions. A, 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 key key element there um, that, that companies are looking at. Fantastic. Thank you, Tim. No, we're conscious of time. Thank you so much uh, for joining us, Glenn. It's greatly appreciated. And if anyone has any questions, uh, wants to chat further, please don't hesitate to reach out directly. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Thank Thanks, you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.